Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is going to be a challenging message. Are you ready? <laughs> but I have to share what the Lord's put on my heart. So, challenge or not, here we go. Uh, the title of this message is The Potter's Wheel, America on the Potter's Wheel. Ah, there it is. America on the Potter's Wheel. And um, how should we now live? In, in fact, in view of the fact that America's on the potter's wheel, first of all, we have to learn the hard facts about America's on the potter's wheel. The last 10 days, we have seen some terrible scenes, haven't we? We've seen America leave in a rather, I don't know what the adjective is for it, but a rather terrible way from Afghanistan. A lot of disarray, a lot of uh, confusion, a lot of disgrace, I would say, and a lot of defeat. And that's only one of the things that happened. But here's thousands of people trying to get into the airport to get out, and everybody that wanted to get out and should have gotten out has not yet gotten out. And then uh, another factor we have in there was, I don't know how many of y'all have read all the military equipment that was left behind. You might have seen some pictures that some were destroyed. That was just a few pieces that were in the airport there at Kabul. There were m most of the military equipment had already been captured by the uh, Taliban. But when the uh, Afghan security forces just gave up and dropped their weapons, dropped their Humvees, dropped, well, I don't know if they even had helicopter pilots, but all of that's been captured and it's flowing now to Pakistan and I've heard that it may flow, some may flow to China and Russia because they want to check out that uh, equipment and use it. Uh, there's a principle in the Bible, by the way, to the victor belongs the spoil. To the victor belongs the spoil. So according to God's view, according to the spoil here, uh, the Taliban won and we lost uh, after 20 years. So we went there 20 years ago to get rid of the, to, to tamp down and get rid of the radical Islamic terrorists. And uh, after 20 years, the superpower left and the radical Islamic, Islamic, Islamic terrorists from the poorest nation in Asia won. If that's not a defeat, I don't know what is a defeat. And then also in the last 10 days, we had a hurricane hit New Orleans exactly on the 16th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. So you have to begin asking yourself, what is going on? What is going on with America? And there's a lot of other things we could mention too, but these are, these are headlines in the last 10 days. Oh yes, the wildfires. The wildfires going on now in the West and the, the record number of acres burned last year and I'm not sure, but we'll have to wait and see, but a record number could be burn this year too. The potter's wheel, where do I get that from? Jeremiah was a prophet to the nations. We think of him about being a prophet to uh, Jerusalem and the people of Judah right up before they fell. He prophesied during that, leading up to that time of the fall of uh, Jerusalem in 586 BC. But Jeremiah, right in the beginning, was told he's going to be a prophet to the nations, not just Judah, but to the nations. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and the kingdoms to pluck down to and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. So he had this ministry to prophesy about the nations, and we're going to see how God deals with the nations. In chapter 18 of Jeremiah, God gives him a visual uh, lesson, and he takes him down to the potter's house. And on the potter's wheel, there's a vessel being made, and then, you know, the vessel, if it's spoiled in the potter's hand, it can be smashed down and made into another's vessel. 
And this is exactly the lesson that he's telling uh, Jeremiah. Now, what he's telling him really is about Judah in one sense. He says, I'm, I'm going to have to remake you guys. I'm going to have to smash you down and remake you because your heart, your heart is wrong. Everything is wrong with you. So I'm going to have to change my doings with you. Uh, but the Lord was making of clay, of, well, the best that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter. So he remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Cannot I, can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does? Declares the Lord, Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At one moment I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, to pull down, or destroy it. If that nation against which I have spoken turn from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I plan to bring on it. Or at another moment I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to build it up or to plan it. If it does evil in my sight, if it does evil in my sight, by not obeying my word, then I will think better of the good with which I had promised to bless it. The pot in, in this passage to Jeremiah uh, in, in 18, here's a commentary, the New Bible commentary. The potter, displeased of the pot he is making, makes another pot out of the same clay. That's his intention, to make another pot. The Lord then declares that the potter, he is free to revise his intentions for Judah. So he's talking to, about Judah, prophecies about Judah. But then he puts in three verses. The principle is developed and applied to any nation. He says, if any nation or any kingdom. So this means God is the potter. He is the one over the control of every nation in the world during time. And he, has, he deals with every nation sovereignly according to his ways, according to his principles, and according to how they are. Some he'll plant, and then some he'll build up. Some he'll tear down. The crucial point, however, in verse 11, the commentator is saying, is that even though the Lord has formed a plan to judge his people, that was Judah, there is still time for them to repent. Repentance can always repent avert the disaster plan that God has for them. But the Lord's appeal, the Lord's appeal to them to change and repent was real back then. And, in, in, uh, you know, as, as Judah was about to be, uh, Jerusalem was about to be taken down. But he knows that they will not respond because of the hardness of their hearts. When they are judged, it will be as a result of their own choosing. They choose to have a hardened heart. So although the prophet is talking about dealing with Judah at that particular time in history, he's telling us in these three key verses, he is a potter over every nation, including the nation of America. And he will deal with America as he chooses. But the principle, the main principle is uh, that God can plant, he can build up, but he also can take down if his voice is not obeyed. Uh, let's see. So Judah did not obey God's voice, and they hardened their heart, and they, they turned away from God and had idolatry and so on and so forth. So what did God do to them? Well, he has a, uh, uh, a way of dealing with people, but he talked specifically how he would deal with Judah. And his principles he laid out are in Leviticus 26. That's the next slide his pattern of dealing with the nations which he has planted and built up, but then turned from him in his word. I believe that this pattern that he has for Judah is a pattern that he has for any nation, that he has built up and blessed, if there is a nation like that, that he will have a pattern in dealing with them. If you go to Leviticus 26, I wouldn't go there now, but you can if you want to, uh, his pattern is... Um, He's trying to bring it to repentance. So he brings judgment on a nation for repentance, hoping that they will turn, turn from their ways. But if there is no repentance in that chapter, in that portion, you see that there is further judgment 
These are what we call remedial judgments. They're judgments sent for a purpose to bring about repentance. But the lack of repentance means more judgments and more severe judgments to try to get them to turn. He says several times, if also after these things, after one smack of judgment, you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sin. Seven times more. The cycle in that chapter is repeated five times. Five times. The five, by the way, in the Bible probably signifies responsibility. So he, this is he's dealing with the responsibility of this nation which should have before him. Uh, the final chapter ends in the devastating judgment for Israel, and he, he, prom he promises there, I'm going to rip you out of the land, I'm going to scatter you, etc., and uh, many other, some other bad things. So I have to say, in my opinion, based on my study of the Word of God and what's been going on, God has been judging America. Why has God been judging America? Because America has turned away from God. America has turned away from God's Word. This nation was founded uh, on the principles of God's Word, the judicial system, our Constitution, and everything. It was in our schools. You know, the Bible used to be read in our schools. Everything was to do with God's Word. That started to disappear, of course, in the 60s. Other things began to disappear. There was no recognition in the, in the public square eventually. Anyway, God has been slowly, patiently dealing with America through judgments. And I want to look at some of the major judgments in the last 20 years. The first one is, the, uh, of course, the attack of not September 11th, and that's coming up in about in one, one week, less than one week. That was a judgment by God on America. That was a judgment to get us to turn back to him as a nation. And I'm not talking about the church, but of course he wants the church to respond too because really the church, in a lot of ways, has turned away from God too. But as a nation, we had abandoned God. As a nation, we had turned away from his word. As a nation, we didn't really recognize him. We didn't really... We weren't really one nation under God. We were one nation under ourselves and our ways, which, got, which were getting worse and worse. So that attack was supposed to bring us to repentance. And some people went to the pews, went to the churches to pray, and that lasted about three weeks, maybe. But as a nation, was there any natural, national repentance? Was there any saying, God, we're sorry for the way we've lived. We're sorry that we've turned away from you. We were wrong in the way of rejecting you in our society. The answer is no, there wasn't. In fact, it was just songs about God bless America. God, I remember David Wilkerson. How many, how many of y'all remember David Wilkerson was a real prophet of the, of the Lord, right? Boy, he was so sorrowful, so sorrowful about the response of the, of the people of America after that time. Why was he so sorrowful? because they didn't have any real repentance. They would sing God bless America and stand on the, on the Congress, steps of the Congress and sing God bless America. They should have been there kneeling in repentance. David Wilkinson was just torn up, torn up that there was no real response to God. These are only some of the things that I've picked, but there was a stock market crash after 9-11. By the way, I could really use that bottle of water over there, Andrew, that I forgot to bring up. <laughs> there was a stock market crash on September 17th, just six days after that. They had closed the market for a while. Thank you. They had closed the market for a while. That week. And then they opened it up. The Dow Jones lost 684 points, which was a point record of loss in one session, one trading session. And the interesting thing is, when did that loss occur? Well, it's been pointed out on the Jewish calendar, it happened on the last day of the Jewish civil year, the 29th of the month of Lul. The next month is the month Tishri, Ish Ish ushers in, in, the fall of the year. Well. That day, the 29th of Elul, is a particular interesting day because uh, that day on the Jewish calendar, every seven years, 
at the end of a seven-year cycle, it's a day that all debts are cleared. The creditors release. It's a day of release. Creditors release the debtors from their debts, and the debtors take it off their books if they owe anything. So the Jewish calendar, the one they use today, uh, that was the last day of a seventh cycle. And so the next day, the first day of Tishri, began a new seven years. Okay? But that day, has all, well, that day of the 29th of Elul, was the end of a seventh day count. Ca- ca- seven years in the Jewish calendar. So what happened on that day, September 17th? There was a huge financial clearance. There was a huge upset in the financial markets of the United States that day. Well, maybe that was coincidence. But exactly seven years later, on the same day, the 29th of Elul, Elul, in 2008, the greatest point crash in history happened. Exactly seven years later, to the day, to the hour, the mark closes about 4 o'clock, and then the day of Tishri starts at sundown that day. There was a point crash of 777 points seven years later, exactly on the Jewish calendar. I don't know how you could call that a coincidence. To me, that has God's fingerprints all over it. Like, are you listening? Are you listening? Are you listening? That brought in the quote, quote, Great Recession that caused us to do all kinds of the TARP plan. We spent billions of dollars trying to resurrect things, get things back into place. Um, but guess what? It didn't happen. The number of natural disasters, you know God had four, has four severe judgment, four severe judgments he used in the Old Testament times, and they were called the sword, uh, famine, plague, and wild beast. Thank goodness I haven't seen a wild beast yet in America. But the number of natural disasters, natural disasters, let's, like a f- famine can be a natural disaster because you, you don't have any crops. But the number of natural disasters exceeding $1 billion a year have absolutely gone mushroom since 2002. If you, if you, I pulled up a chart on it this week. And uh, every year since 2002, we've had at least five and up to 16 occurrences of natural disasters, you know, hurricanes, wildfires, all that kind of stuff, floods, all that kind of stuff, that cost a billion dollars or more. That has dramatically increased in the last 20 years. And Amos 3, 6, you can, go, you can read Amos chapter 3 and 4 if you want to this afternoon. I recommend you look at it sometime. Amos 3 tells us, chapter 3, verse 6, is there a calamity in the city unless the Lord has done it? Natural disasters are under the hand of God, brothers and sisters. They're under the hand of God. The Lord has done it. The Lord has caused these natural disasters. His hand is behind it. It's not global warming. Sometimes there can be secondary causes, but the primary cause is is God. The five most most costly hurricanes in U.S. history have happened in just the past few years. Well, Katrina. Katrina was number one in 2005. Then we have Harvey. Maria was in the U.S. territory, Puerto Rico, Sandy, and Irma. And, of course, Ida just happened exactly on the 16th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. How much it will cost, we don't know. But it's not going to be cheap. And then we have the COVID virus, which has hit the U.S. And uh, some of you may say, well, did God cause, is God behind the COVID virus? We'll talk about that in just a minute. But, yes, he is. And the federal government has gone deeply into debt in order to boost the economy from the virus hit. We're spending, you're an accountant, $29 trillion in debt. How's that going to work out, Andy? Not well. It's not going to work out well. Then there was the humiliation and defeat in Afghanistan. The Islamic radicals in the poorest country in Asia defeated the superpower after 20 years. Think about it. That is a military defeat. 
We may also include the Romans 1 judgments of God. Many teach the Romans 1 judgment of God where God backs away when people are sinful and gives them over to their own lust, their own desires, their own sinful desires. In two or three couple of stages there, sexual perversion and finally to a reprobate mind. A reprobate mind due to our rejection of truth, due to the person, to the nation, or rather the society's rejection of truth, gains in a reprobate mind that can't think straight. They think you can change from a boy to a girl, and that's fine, and then you'll be criticized if you try to say something about it. That is a reprobate mind. Uh, then you can be a reprobate mind for many other things. Uh, mainly, You might say mainly they're due to moral things, but it could be other things. We've got some people in our Congress that have reprobate minds. They think you can spend funny money forever, and it doesn't matter. We have a lot of irrational thinking going on now in, our, in the halls of government, and some of the things that people are saying. You look at it and you say, man, it's just screwball what they're saying, right? It is screwball. But God's given them over to that reprobate mind as a judgment to try to until it gets so bad, he hopes people will turn and change. God's reason for these judgments, Amos chapter 4. We can't forget this. Because if you forget this, if you forget that God is trying to actually do something positive in mankind, then you will, you will, you will reject this whole idea and you, you won't understand it. Amos 3 says, if a calamity occurs in a city, has not the Lord done it? But if you read several verses in Amos 4, God explains why he's doing this kind of a thing. Why is God doing this kind of a thing? <clears throat> he says, I sent these things, calamity after calamity, yet you have not returned to me. He sends them all in hopes that people will come to their senses in hopes they will fall to their knees, in hopes they will repent and turn to God. That's the reason he does it. All of his remedial judgments are, producing, are aimed at producing an ultimate good, not for just causing havoc. Our true spiritual fellowship with God. What is, what is the best most thing we need the most is our healthy relationship with God, not prosperity. So God has been ex extending these judgments uh, upon America. There's been no discernible national repentance. I'm talking about as a country with an idea, with any, any idea that we should turn back to God or that kind of a thing. I'm not talking about the, the church, but the church, he's also doing something with the church. We'll mention that in a minute. In 20 years. So I don't think we can expect further blessing. I think we can expect further pulling down, pulling down. This is a hard message. I said it'd be challenging. But I'm here to speak what I believe God is trying to tell us and speak what's according to his word. Here's a booklet I wrote exactly, put it in print almost exactly one year ago today. Uh, Donnie has read the booklet. He really liked it. He said he hopes it gets wide distribution. Uh, maybe I will see if we put some back there into the library, into the uh, book room. The biblical, something from the uh, index, the biblical connection between the coronavirus, birth pains, and the end of the age. Is God behind the coronavirus pan pandemic? And I spell out why he is, how he used plagues in the Old Testament to turn people. And uh, I quote some other people, a, a, a Dallas Seminary professor, uh, John Piper, um, He's not the Dallas Seminary professor. The Dallas Seminary professor is Mark Hitchcock, who wrote a book about the coronavirus. He also believes it's a judgment from God that turns to repentance. And um, some, other, some other people. Is it one of the birth pains of the end of the age? You know, because it talks about birth pains in Matthew. I personally do not believe so. I personally believe, and there's a difference of opinion here, but most evangelicals, many evangelicals, believe the birth pains were in the last step, sometime in the last seven years. I take that view. And, uh, but I believe that the coronavirus is a warning from God, 
a, not just to America, of course, to the whole world, a warning. Wake up. Wake up. I'm not happy. I'm not happy with the way the world is going. Would you be happy if you were God with the way the world is going? No. I'm warning you. Judgment. I'm warning you. Wake up. Turn. So there's other people that support that view. Uh, so the pandemic is one of the birth pains of the end of the age, but it's not, uh, not one of the birth pains of the, the coronavirus curve. It's not one of the birth pains of the end of the age. But it is a foreshadowing of them and a warning that they are coming. March Hitchcock, who's a prophecy writer, uh, uh, Dallas CEO guy, he says it could be the final warning. It could be the final warning. I got another witness here to what I'm saying. I really re highly recommend you watch this video. Dr. David Reagan is a, a well-known and respected uh, Bible prophecy teacher. And his message is Jesus is soon, coming again soon. That's been his message for years. God, you ought to read, hear his testimony of how he got put into that ministry. It's pretty fantastic. But anyway, uh, God told him that's what he wanted to share, that Jesus is coming again soon. So he released a video. You can find it at ChristinProphecy.org. What is God doing in our America? But the name of the video might, might show up as America's Future. Reagan answers the question, what is God doing in America? 20 years ago, my answer would have been he's calling the nation to repentance. Today, my answer is different. My answer is that he's warning us of his impending wrath. I believe, this is quoting David Reagan, I believe America is finished. We have passed the point of no return. The Bible teaches there is such a point of no return in the history of a nation. The Bible refers to it in several places as a point where the wound becomes incurable. Like ancient Judah, we are currently are a nation in an all-out, full-scale rebellion against God and his word. The Judeo-Christian consensus, Judeo-Christian consensus that made this nation great is gone, and our days are numbered. <clears throat> what should be the believer's response? Now is how should we live? What should be our response? When things happened to Job but everything went bad, and it didn't seem like it was even his fault, he arose and tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God for doing something wrong. This should be our attitude. If God judges America and continues to judge, we should say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's your job. You're the potter, God, not me. God gives grace to the humble. He opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble, the independent, the guy that wants things his way. But the humble is the guy that lowers himself before God and says, God, whatever your way is, I want to be dependent upon you and humble before you. We should humble ourselves, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, 1 Peter 5, 6 says. We should humble ourselves. The mighty hand speaks of God's sovereign rule. We should humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, his sovereign rule. And uh, his hand is not only judging our nation, but he's also using this arrangement to purify the lives of believers. He's working on the lives of believers, too. God uses various trials in the same book in 1 Peter to bring forth Christian maturity in our lives. The downfall of our nation is a great trial. The judgment is likely to go further. But God says, in various trials, greatly rejoice. Even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. So it's a proof of your faith, like Andy was talking about this morning, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Like you said, Andy, God's giving us a chance to grow and get ready for the judgment seat of Christ. 
Walk wisely in these days. This is another thing, how we should live in these days. We should walk wisely. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. See then that you do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. This is something we all need, including myself, to every day realize what really is God's will for me today. What really is God's will, how I spend my time, what I'm focused on, what my reactions are. Right? Okay, I've got three ways that people, that believers might walk. Believers might walk as we see America decline. Number one, I call the patriot approach. You focus your energy on halting the slide of America. Let's make America great again. We can do it. Let's get our, I'm not saying anything against Trump. I'm just making a point, okay? Let's fight it. Let's fight the decline. Let's get, fight to turn things around for America. I say, America is under God's judgment. Pick your battles. If you want to go to a local, if you feel God's leading you to a local school board to stop some horrible school book coming into the schoolroom, that could be the Lord leading you to do that. You know, that's what God may do that. There may be some places where God wants you to do something specific to stop some iniquity, okay, in the land. I'm not saying that's not true. Or vote for a certain person because it helps. But if you get on a big bandwagon, you get on a big energy kick of many Christians who were so into the last uh, political campaign. They were spending all of their energy trying to get their man back into office. I just say be careful. Be careful how you spend your time in light of the fact we're under God's hand of judgment. There will not be, I do not believe, there will not, and Reagan does a better job than I ever will do of explaining why there will not be a national repentance. There could be individual repentance. There could be a repentance in a body of believers, but a national repentance is probably not going to happen. Then there's the selfie approach. How do you like that term, Andy? There's the selfie approach. This is the one I think can affect all of us. This is the one we really have to watch out for. The selfie approach, well, I see things are getting bad, so I'm going to have the, I'm going to have the best time I can now before it gets too bad. Or I'm going to focus on just taking care of my family and myself. Things are getting bad. Things are getting horrible. So I'm just going to, you know, circle the wagons and make sure that we're not hurt too bad. That can affect every one of us, brothers and sisters. Be careful. Be careful that you're doing the will of God. Then there's what I call the waiting Christian servant approach. The waiting Christian servant approach. Make the most of your time by walking in fellowship with the Lord, seeking the Lord, learning of him, growing in Christ each day, and being a servant of the Lord. Your focus is you want to grow in Christ and serve the Lord during this time. Serve him. Reach out for, to others with him. Build up the body of Christ with your gifts, with your talents that God has given you and with the opportunities he gives you. This is a time we can really Get rid of some of the clutter on our to-do list and our fun list and be serious about serving the Lord. Uh, Titus 2, 11 through 13. These are, you talked about meditating. I, I'm, I'm back doing a little Bible memory right now. These are three terrific verses to memorize right now in light of what's happening. Terrific verses. We love them. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, all the, all the things we can do, all the fun things we can have. We've got to be sure we're walking in what God wants us to, to do, to have, and to be paying attention to, and to spend time on. And live sensibly, a sober-minded way, restrictedly, self-controlled, Sober-minded and controlling ourselves and our desires. Righteously and godly in the present age. Time before the Lord comes back and ushers in a new age. Looking for the blessed hope. Looking for the blessed hope. And the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. This is a great secret. A great secret. Looking 
looking to the Lord's coming. If you look around here, you're going to get depressed. If you look at the Lord and his coming, he's going to bring in a new kingdom and a new age, and his, his reward is with him, then that will, that will be an anchor for you. That will be a positive. That's a hope. It's something positive in the middle of a dismal world. If you put your hope in this world, you put your hope in your career now, what your grandkids are going to do, this and that, you're going to have a lot of disappointments, and you're going to waste some time. And you, it's going to affect your emotions. But if we put our hope in the coming of the Lord, that's going to be helpful. Uh, if we live self-controlled lives now, there will be great reward and blessing for us in Christ's coming kingdom. Discern the times, of the, discern the signs of the times. My tongue is getting tangled today. Matthew 16, 1 through 3. Let's read that real quick. couple of I think it was on two occasions, I may be wrong, but I think it was on two occasions that the Lord, that this is mentioned in the Gospels, that the Lord spoke about this matter of discerning the times. Um, the Pharisees and Sadducees came up, and testing Jesus, they asked him to show us a sign from heaven. But he replied to them, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. In the morning... There will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you, do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times? You great Pharisees, you ones who know the law, you can't figure out what's going on right now. You can't figure out that the Messiah has come. I mean, they, could have been, they couldn't figure out with all those miracles he was doing and fulfilling prophecy that, he, that the Messiah was here. An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and a sign will not be given except the sign of Jonah. That's verse 4. I want to point out some signs of our times which show us that the coming of Jesus Christ to this earth again is very, very close. Israel becomes a nation in 1948. Well, that seems a long time ago to some of you guys that weren't born in 1948. But to John and I, we were around then, right? We might have been in diapers, but <laughs> anyway. Uh, listen, this is the super sign. Bible prophecy teachers say this is the super sign that the end times is, is right around the corner. It's on the corner, on the verge. Israel has to be in the land in order for many prophecies to be fulfilled. Am I right, John? Amen. Preparations for a rebuilt temple. There has to be a temple, a Jewish temple with sacrifices at the end time. Why? Because the Antichrist walks into the temple, 2 Thessalonians 2, and proclaims, it, proclaims itself as God. And because Jesus mentions the abomin abomination of desolation in Matthew 24, 15, that's an abomination in the temple, the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. Well, wait a minute. There's not a temple in Jerusalem. There's only a temple mount, which is under a lots of controversy. But since 1973, some zealous Jews have been preparing for a rebuilt temple. And guess what? They have everything ready except the temple. They've got the, 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 all the candelabra. They got all the, they've built all the, the sacrifices. They've even trained the priests on how to do the sacrifices. They've got all the instruments. They've even got harps that were built just like in the old days. They're ready. They're waiting. They just need the temple mount. They have plans to rebuild the temple. It could even be, I have something about this that you could ask me later, it could even be that they could find the tabernacle stored under the temple mount. The tabernacle that they had in the wilderness. There are some legitimate reasons to believe it may still be there stored in a chamber under the Temple Mount. If they unearthed that, it wouldn't take any time to get that thing set up. Middle East changes and the push for a peace plan. Is there been any push for a peace plan in the Middle East in the last few years? The last 20 or 30 years? Yes. Because of the Palestinian-Israeli problem. That may be what's mentioned in, in Daniel 9, 27. 
you know, the seven-year covenant that, that uh, Antichrist is a party to. That may be once mentioned. A lot of Bible teachers believe that, and that's I'm not saying I'm not saying definitely, but I believe that's very possible. Uh, and then uh, since 2011 with the Arab Spring, the whole thing has changed in the Middle East. The whole thing's turned upside down. You had nations that were stable for years. Egypt was stable. Syria was stable. Libya was stable. Lebanon was stable. All that's been turned upside down in the last 10 years. God is obviously, obviously setting up turmoil and other things to fulfill the end time situation. Wake up, wake up. Apostasy in the church in the end time. Is there any apostasy in the church in the end time? Do we see mainline denominations moving away from truth they once held? Do we see things being like a, a colossal decline, a moral colossal decline in society? Yes, we're seeing this now. That's the reason for the flood judgment was a moral decline. Prepare for the judgment. I'm running out of time, so I'm just, I don't remember how many slides I got. Prepare for the um, judgment seat of Christ. Andy talked about that this morning. Because we're running out of time, and I didn't plan to say much on this anyway, it's a huge topic. It's worthy of a whole book. So I'm going to give you a book. Recommended reading. And this used to be on the shelf back there years ago, I believe. The Believer's Payday by Dr. Paul Benweir. I highly recommend it. You're not going to agree with every single point. I don't know that I agree with every single point. Eschatology is tough to figure out. But I urge every believer who wants to be ready for this awesome event, the Judgment Seat of Christ, to prayerfully read this book. He's a solid Bible teacher. He's a solid guy. Uh, last slide. Andy, how did I get your favorite verse for my last slide? There must have been some communication, right? <laughs> Remember God's promises are to be with us and help us in difficult times. There are going to be more difficult today, days ahead for the U.S. There are going to be more difficult days ahead for the world. But we have God's promises and we have God's spirit. We have God's life. We have God's people. But the promises, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Casting all your anxiety on him. How did I get that verse? You gave that verse, didn't you, brother? <laughs> Ryan? <laughs> Casting all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. In the midst of the storm, there's going to be some more storms, brothers and sisters. God cares for you. Peace I live with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor be afraid. The peace that the Lord had at that very moment was on the night before the cross. All that he said, my peace I give to you. The Lord was at peace the night before the cross. Can you believe that? It's when he uttered these words. And he says, the same peace I have, I give to you. Don't, you can have my peace. You can have my peace. Do not let your heart be troubled. Be afraid. Uh, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Hebrews 13, 5, 6. Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. All these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will have its trouble of its own. The just shall live by faith. And we've always got Psalm 23. So I know this has been a difficult word. I know this has been a challenging word. It was challenging for me, believe me, to pray, prepare it and to think that I had to speak it. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your hand upon our lives. We want to thank you for your work in our lives. And Lord, all that you've been allowing, doing, and been behind in this nation in the last number of years, some of which has made us troubled, even sad. Lord, we bow before you all that's under your hand. And you have your ways, and you have your purposes, Lord. 
And that's what we want to focus on, Lord, is your purposes now for our lives. How are we to live in the midst of a more difficult world? Lord, we pray that each one of us will take it seriously to walk wisely with you, to spend our time in a way that's pleasing unto you, to be pleasing unto you and be ready for the judgment seat of Christ. And Lord, that we can hear in that day that we're faithful servants, that we're good stewards, that we did your will and we built up the body of Christ. So we ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.